Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to, I can't believe it, the 10th edition of 4-4. Um, if you have never joined us before, my name is Nayama Safaya Sandy. Um, I created this conversation series because I was just looking around in the sea of Instagram lives and the myriad Zoom conversations, and I was looking at who I wasn't seeing and who I wasn't hearing from, and I wanted to create a space that could allow for that. And of course, that is Black women, uh, Black non-binary gender fluid folks who are working in this art and culture space and really pushing forward things that we have for a long time not been able to see on the world stage in an appropriate, presented in an appropriate manner. So I'm excited to be able to continue to do that work. Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone. Again, this is 4-4. This is the 10th edition thus far. Today I have with me three figurative artists. Uh, Tiffany Alfonseca, Phoebe Boswell joining us from London, and Jamia Richmond Edwards, all the way from Detroit, currently based in the DC area. Tiffany is joining us from the Bronx, BX stand up. I'm not gonna do like the X thing because I'm not from the Bronx and it's weird. Um, so <laughs> I think maybe I'll give a few minutes for everyone to get here. Um, hello, let's see who we have with us thus far. Hey, Nakia, how are you doing? Zoe, Rafi, Lyle, what's up? Um, also, we love a good chat, so please, please, please have at it in the chat. Um, we will ask all of the panelists to place their Instagram handles in the chat at some point. Also, their website, so you can see more of their work. Uh, so please, please, please take part. Of course, we'd love to know what you think as you look at what they're showing you. So respond there. Also, there is a Q&A function toward the bottom of your screen here. So you can definitely go ahead and ask any questions that you have through the course of the conversation there. So let's get started. I'm super excited to have with us today, Tiffany Alfonseca. Hey, hey everyone. Okay. I'm gonna <laughs> I was stuck on mute for a second, so I... <laughs> it's okay. I'm going to give you a chance to get yourself together because I'm going to read your bio. Okay. Uh, Tiffany Alfonseca is a Bronx based Dominican American mixed media artist who creates vibrant and colorful artworks that celebrates Black and Afro Latinx diasporic culture. Alfonseca continuously taps into her Afro Dominican roots and leverages it, it as a conceptual cantilever that provides a dynamic framework for her artistic practice. Moreover, her work aims to visually articulate that Black and Afro-Latinx diaspora does not exist within a monolith, and that these communities are a cultural cornucopia that is vast, varied, and complex. Alfonseca's artwork is an intricate combination of beauty, diversity, and multilingualism that exemplifies the strength of the Black and Afro-Latinx diaspora. Alfonseca primarily employs the act of painting and drawing as her artistic weapons of choice. Can you tell you how much I'm enjoying reading this? <laughs> I'm like, this is so good. Um, she situates her subjects within bold and picturesque settings and an active pursuit of opportunities that explore the nuances of communities in which she is immersed. Through immersion and rumination, Alfonseca utilizes these experiences as reference material within her work as she toils to construct new narratives and build a universe that is reflective of her upbringing as a Dominican American woman in the Bronx. These narratives hearken towards dialogues about womanhood, colorism, class, family, ritual, and memory, all of which are building blocks in her creation of ontological framework that is responsive to how she sees and experiences the world. Alfonseca's approach to art making is catalyzed by her desire to tussle with W.E.B. Du Bois' philosophy of double consciousness. In order to illustrate that containing multitudes is part of what makes black and brown communities and their experiences unique. While analyzing questions of identity and race, Alfonseca depicts subjects that are strong, graceful, and exuding agency in a world that wants to deny their existence. When you consider a history where black and brown bodies are constantly on guard, Alfonseca's work serves as a safe space teeming with beauty and joy. That was just so great. I'm so happy to have you here. Thank you so much for agreeing to take part. I'm gonna ask you to unmute now. 
take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, I'm Tiffany Alfonseca. I'm from the Bronx. Um, and yeah, I did a great job with that. Um, I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about my background. Um, I just got my BFA in School of Visual Arts. Um, just graduated in May. I've always been into art. Um, just decided to take it a little more serious, maybe three or four years ago. Um, so I'm going to start off by showing you one of the first paintings that I ever made. Um, my work is really usually, I would say like mixed media based. Um, I would say I started off as just drawing, but within the years, like I really found my calling, which is painting mostly. Um, but I dabbled in everything like silk screen, um, embroidery work, fibers, related works and stuff like that. But yes, let me show you the first painting that I ever really painted and that I actually really, really like. So, okay. So this, okay, let me just enlarge that a little bit. No, nope, wrong option. <laughs> but um, this is one of the first paintings I ever created, um, which was back in 2018. In the set, not the first painting I created, but something that it actually um, was meaningful for me and like my community as well as the culture and stuff like that. Um, so this, the title of this painting is I Hope My, I Hope My Blackness Offends You. And I was really inspired in creating this because I went to, again, School of Visual Arts and the diversity there was just, there's no diversity there. It's just like a handful of, Black and Latinx people. Um, I would literally say maybe three in my grade or four. Everybody else was um, majorly white and Asian. So they weren't really used to seeing like a lot of different things or yeah. So I decided to um, paint something like this. Um, this is acrylic medium. And at the time I would just use um, reference photos online and stuff like that because I didn't have any models or anything um, for the body or the figure. But most of the time, a lot of this comes from my head and just stuff that I want to see growing up, like stuff that I wish I seen growing up. Um, growing up, I went to an art high school as well. They didn't teach me about any black artists or any like Latinx artists. I just pretty much figured it out along the way um going to school of visual arts they didn't teach me either um i would say maybe i learned it about more black and latinx artists 2018 and 2017 and that was just on my own um yeah <laughs> so that was one of the first um a little bit about that i just wanted to like really emphasize the moment of and like the focus of just having a black or brown body in a space of intimacy, leisure, um, relaxing, um, to normalize that instead of like being fetishized all the time. Um, I feel that's really important. Um, we're not supposed to just be something for pleasure. Like a black or brown body is not just for pleasure. And there's so many other things. We're, we're normal, we're the same thing. It's, you know what I'm saying? Like. <laughs> It's about that time, like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's about that time we see it being normalized, you know? Um, this is another piece that I did also in 2018. Um, it's called What a Real Barbie Looks Like. And I don't know, this piece also reminds me of my sister. My sister, um, we look nothing alike, by the way. <laughs> like, if you were to see us, you'll be like, what the hell? But, um, yeah, she, I would, I don't know, like, she just reminds me of, like, a Barbie. And, like, <laughs> and I kind of wanted to capture that moment, having another brown body just, like, coming out the pool. And also, this is in reference to David Hockney um, in his series of having, like, men coming out of the pool. Um, I just felt like it would be kind of humorous to have, like, a brown body like bad bitch coming out of the pool instead of having like a gay white figure as he would have it. So I thought it was just kind of like funny to remaster that. 
Um, let me see. Then, um, actually for this year, before all the quarantine started, like around March, I had my open studios at the School of Visual Arts. And I was working on like creating three large paintings talking about like my memories of growing up. Um, stuff that I remember vividly would always be music. Um, having coming from a Dominican background is always party party, music, <laughs> food, hair. So those are like just memories that really always will always be with me. Um, every Sunday. So this piece is called Iglesia. And I know a lot of people usually go to like church on Sundays. But, yeah. mm -hmm. I don't know that we're seeing what you're seeing. Oh, no, really? We what do you see seeing, there? I hope my blackness offends you. Really? Oh, wow. Hold on. Because I see Iglesia. Um, it may be that you were sharing like a particular folder. And is this image in the same folder? Oh, so you guys didn't see um, what a real Barbie looks like? We did. Oh, that's... but it just went back to. Um, hmm. Image. Let me try it again. Yeah. Okay. How about now? Can you guys see it? Okay. Let me just enlarge it a little. Oh. Okay. Yeah. So, like I said, growing up, I um, I know a lot of people would typically like go maybe to church. Um, but me and my best friend, we would always go to the salon every Sunday because, again, like our parents really didn't know how to manage our hair or like they just didn't want to. <laughs> and we always wanted to look like glammed up and we really didn't appreciate like our hair at the time. But it's, you know, because of how we grew up and stuff like that. And we would always be in the salon. We would wait there for hours, literally like eight hours just sitting and in a Dominican salon, like Caribbean salons, they're always chatting. They forget about the clients and stuff like that. So we'll be waiting <laughs> and just like there forever. And I just wanted to like get the moment where we finally hit the chair. Like we're about to go home. We're about to look fly. Like, you know, so that's um, something really important to me. Hair is like a big part of my identity, like big deal. Um, and yeah, this is also like a reference photo that I had like taken of my friend's mother in the salon. Her her mom is the stylist and then her aunt is um, the client. So it's not me and my best friend, but it still represents both of us. Um, I actually really enjoy this one that I did of George Floyd. I think it's just... It's just a, you, you could say so much about this, you know, especially now everything going on. Um, it's sad to say that it's still happening, but um, it makes me wonder a lot too, like, would this get so much attention if it was like a, like a brown queer body? Or, I don't know, I always think about this when I see this. I really enjoyed doing this, you know, but it just raises a lot of questions for me. Um, yeah, and I felt like it would be like a very special gift to give to the family. Also, like give them something to heal with, even though it's not much, but just know that a lot of people are thinking about their son, their husband, their brother. Um, he's in our hearts as well. I don't, I personally never met him, of course, but um, that story resonated a lot with me. Um, okay, so I have here, some of the quarantine series drawings that I did. And basically this project was where I asked um, some people from Instagram, some of my family members, um, friends, just anybody who wanted to participate in it to pose for me um, during the quarantine, like to see, like just kind of checking in because I felt very restricted being home. And I felt like, oh my gosh, like this is what I have to work in now in my living room. Like I was just wondering how everybody was feeling at the time. So I asked some of my family members first to pose for me, um, literally just set the self timer up. And I could, may say these are like great for just people that don't have any photography experience. Like these photos came out great. <laughs> but yeah, so this is Rose. This is actually my friend Jane's um, mother. So she participated in it as well. Um, and again, it's just like pretty much speaking about 
like having brown bodies in places of relaxation, like just chilling at home. Um, this was, but this was one of my favorite pieces. That's why I showed it first. It didn't start it, but it didn't start the series. But yeah, like this is just lovely. I really love that one. Um, this was actually the first piece, I think, that started it. And this is Larry Osea Mensa. Um, I consider him like, um, I would say like a mentor. And, you know, I, I felt like I needed to draw him because he's just like brilliant. I love him so much already. <laughs> like he has so much knowledge and I don't know, like I felt like he needed to be a part of this series. Um, this is one of my best friends. Her name is Mathy Santana. Um, she's also an artist. Um, we have a lot of similarities. I felt like I wanted to capture her like spunky personality. Like just look at the pose. Like it's just so her, like she's such a badass. Um, let me see here. Oh, I have here Selena. I went to high school with her and I haven't spoken to her in so long, but I've always admired her personality, um, her style, like I love her style and she's just so like down to earth, um, great personality. So I also wanted to get her in this project. Um, a lot of the things that like captured me to maybe like reach out to someone was just like memories a lot of my work has like memory based so if like i remember something about you that just like easily attracts me like i'm gonna try to work with you on something <laughs> um and then here i have josephine and devone um it's so funny we went to college together and she's so sweet and she just um not recently but i would say like two years ago she moved to la and with her hubby they're mad cute and i really admired like that love that they share so i wanted to capture that too like um normalize black intimacy black love um is very like delicate like i just see them and it's like so genuine and pure um and i needed to get that <laughs> and then um I captured me. I never like, I never like to show my face in anything. I'm just like super reserved. Like even this right now, it's like, whoa, it's a big step for me <laughs> doing this um, talk. But um, yeah, I feel like I, you know, I got to get into it a little bit more, show my face sometimes. You got to see who I am, who the artist is. Um, but yeah, I captured myself for the, the quarantine series too. Actually my roommate, she captured this photo for me. Um, and yeah, like, I I tried to like put these two paintings in it, Iglesia and I Hope My Blackness Offends You in it. Um, because those are like my two babies. Like those are my favorites, absolute favorites. Um, yeah, and they just say a lot about me too. So yeah. So then after all of that, I decided to make some of them into paintings. And I made, let me see. I made um, Mati, my friend Mati, into a painting. Um, it's mixed media. It has like, I used acrylic, um, charcoal, glitter. You're gonna see a lot of my work with glitter. Um, it's just something, again, that I've seen growing up a lot. Just a lot of reflective, um, iridescent, um, shiny things. My mother, she is very into interior design. <laughs> so everything was always shiny, turquoise, yellow, pink, like, Pretty much everything you see here is like what I saw growing up in my house. Um, yeah. And I've always had like a love for patterns, but I never really knew where to incorporate it. I, I find myself thinking a lot about certain things, but don't really incorporate it because I don't want it to just look random. Um, but yeah, here I like played around with the pattern a little bit. It's a little bit different from the drawing because... I don't know, but always going to like a Dominican household, like an apartment or just like a regular house. I would see like that wallpaper, um, like always like kind of vintage antique, but it's like floral design or um, has leaves or something like that. So I kind of wanted to like throw that in, but have like a little modern twist to it. Um, this kind of reminds me, I don't know if it reminds you guys of Silkscreen, but like the prints in the back. So that's like my modern twist to it and just having like a red couch or like 
something bright and bold like that is um, super like Caribbean. Um, then I have here, I did Jane and I just like totally completely like, added so many colors. Um, <laughs> like her house was um, very, very white, um, white walls and everything like that. But it kind of reminded me like that spot that she was in, it reminded me of um, one of my friend's houses that I used to go to and it was just like colorful. So I'm like, you know what, let me add those colors that I saw um, into this. And also I know you guys see like that the, the clothing are very like, just white and black but i wanted to refer it back to the drawing where i left some spaces um colorful i mean some places white and black um but then add my spark to it with the painting everywhere else you know um yeah and then i'm actually going to show you guys a painting that i haven't really showed anybody yet but it was just in um uta virtual show um every day is Sunday and this is just touching base on like LGBTQ plus community um that here we have like um, a very masculine woman and a very feminine woman sharing a love and the title is in Spanish um but I'll translate it for you guys it's I hope you um told your mother about us and I feel like in a lot of Caribbean households you know you hold back on the fear of telling your family, um, they may be in disgust. Um, you know, a lot of people are not privileged to have like families that are really accepting. So I wanted to speak about that as well. Um, yeah. And I feel like my new work is going to speak about a lot of that, a lot of those issues. Um, cause it's very important to me. Um, but yeah, this is what I have to show you guys today. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much. No, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for being here. Thanks. Okay, can you? Oh, yes. Yeah. Stop sharing with my guy. Okay. <laughs> All right. So next we have Phoebe Boswell. I'm super excited. Um, Phoebe has always had a fragile sense of the notion of home and belonging. Born in Nairobi and Kenya to a Kikuyu mother and fourth generation British Kenyan father, she is brought up as an expatriate in the Arabian Gulf and now lives and works in London. Her history is rooted in colonial traces, contradictory legacies and patterns of migration. She describes her work as a navigation of the space between anchored to what she refers to as quote, a restless state of diasporic consciousness, close quote. Combining draftswomanship and digital technology, she creates immersive installations and bodies of work which layer drawing, animation, sound, video, and interactivity in an effort to find languages robust yet open and multifaceted enough to house, center, and celebrate complex communities, voices, hearts, and histories, which, like her own, are often systematically marginalized, simplified, pacified, homogenized or sidelined as other. Phoebe studied at the Slade School of Art in Central St. Martin and currently lives and works in London. Her work has been exhibited in various forms in the UK, Europe, Africa, and the US. Boswell is a recent recipient of the Paul Hamlin Award for Artists, a Ford Foundation Fellow, and her next institutional solo will be at New Art Exchange Nottingham, UK, due to open in October, 2020. Her most recently unveiled I'm sorry, I can't read. Her most recently unveiled large scale public work platform 2020 at Lancy Batchet. Is it Bachet? Is that right? Or is it Batchet? I feel like it's Bachet if it's in Geneva. A uh, railway station in Geneva in July 2020, commissioned and produced by the Fonds Cantonal d'Art Contemporain, Geneva for, her, for the Mirror program. It's one of select artists for the next iteration of Prospect New Orleans. Shout out to Naima Keith. And is represented in the US by Sapar Contemporary New York. So excited to have Phoebe here. Um, I will let you just do your thing. Spotlight um, on you now. Hello, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to share my 
screen uh, now. Um, and that was amazing, uh, Tiffany. And I, uh, okay, is that, can you see, is that cool? Um, yeah, I was really, I was so moved by everything Tiffany was saying and showing. And I thought that maybe perhaps I'll start by um, reading a small uh, uh, piece from uh, an essay, a, a visual essay um, on decoloniality because it speaks about um, that situation at art school uh, where you're not seen and where you don't see yourself. And it was really interesting that you spoke about your sister um, because this exact passage comes from uh, this moment when one of my art teachers looked at this half-finished painting of my sister and just the things he said about it would just, they actually paralyzed me for the rest of my time in art school. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so I'm going to start with that and then I'm just going to kind of wash into some, into some work. Um, but yeah, I'll just begin. So, I refuse the tyranny of a singular narrative. I am finally ready to speak. I start to think more acutely about the space I occupy in the world and the space between myself and home, belonging, whatever that is. And I recognize that I need to create for myself a language robust and fluid and layered enough to house the whole of me, of us. I need ammunition. I need new language to explain myself. I refuse to be some white guy's narrow version of me. I refuse it. There really is no way to depict my sister in one single portrait. She is way too beautiful and too complex for that. We all are. We, us folk who don't adhere to aesthetics, to the normative and institutionalized and dominant voice. Us, us border beings, the damned as Fanon would say. We are rhizomatic and time-based. We are the truth of our ancestors and also the future. We are memory and earth and freedom and hope. We are layered and contradictory and difficult to love. We are an open work. We are speculative and nuanced and multidisciplinary and interactive and decolonial. We cannot be told as a single image or as a single screen film or by anyone else. Over time, I begin to gather skills. I draw a lot. I learn how to animate. I think spatially. I become mesmerized by projectors. And I realize how much I love and how much I need to tell stories. So, um, so that was just that. But um, so uh, I'm going to start with Mutumia. So this was a photograph I was sent by a friend of mine, Juliana Kotvitek, who's a writer and um, a Ugandan writer. And my initial feeling to this photograph was, oh my God, what is happening to these women? What's being done to them? How are they being brutalized and by who? And then she sent me the story and these women are actually, in fact, um, they're the Acholi women of Apa in Uganda. And they were fighting, their community was fighting land right issues. And on this day, the government had sent in military to come and remove the people from their lands. And the women had decided enough is enough. We're going to do what we can. We've allowed the men to speak and it hasn't worked. So um, in many African cultures, it's a taboo for men to see their mothers naked because to see your mother naked is to remember uh, the birth of, a, of, of yourself. And, um, and the power, the all power of, of the mother. And so a man, no matter how powerful he is, being reminded of the power of a mother puts the worst curse on the man because he cannot be powerful anymore in the presence of a mother. So this photograph, which I thought was, um, because of the way I was also conditioned to understand um, the black woman body, um, the, and the, the, the nude black woman body, I assumed it was a victimized image, but actually it was a very heroic image. And these women affected change that day 
but change that that these types of moments are not always documented in history because history is usually written by uh, men or by people who don't look like us. So um, then I started uh, researching all these moments when women have done this, and I wanted to make a salute to them. Um, and I also wanted to think about how um, the nude uh, body is it has been used in the Western kind of canon of art and how it's a passive, it's always passive, it's always um, eroticized or exoticized or silenced um, or it's erased completely. So I wanted to make this, um, uh, this work, it's called Mutumia. Um, and I wanted to use real women, um, real women's bodies. So I put a call out and asked women to come and join my army. They came to my studio and one on one we went on this kind of emotional journey of what it means to protest um the resulting work is a multi-channel um uh, hand-drawn animation which is uh a half an hour long and um these drawn figures go through various emotional states of protest um each of these women brought such a kind of clarity to the project in ways that like they understood it even more than me to a certain extent. So I want, I, I, it became really necessary that, that vo their voices were there and also to kind of disrupt the, um, the, the silence and the kind of austere silence you hear in museums and galleries. So, um, so they project onto all the walls of the gallery and in the floor are hidden sensors and each sensor is linked to a soundtrack and I worked with a gospel choir, I worked with Kenyan women writers, reading from their um, feminist prose. I had a conversation with my mother. I um, provoked uh, women to answer questions that came from Audrey Lord's uh, Transforming Silence into Language and Action. And so when the room is empty, it's silent, even though that animation is taking place. But if you stand in the room and you stand amongst these women and you acknowledge their presence in this very white, very male dominated space, um, you enable the voices to be heard. So if the room is full, there's a loud crescendo. Um, uh, I also placed uh, the same provocations in the space and also uh, char charcoal on a white ground, which is the medium I had to make the work. Um, kind of provoking the audience to, to, uh, to know that they were active and that their presence could also shift things. Um, uh, this was it when I showed it in Ukraine, in Kiev, um, uh, and then a couple of days off. And, and it was kind of a titillating thing. It was like, it's still an artwork. Does she mean we can touch it? Or is it just to, you know, for the notion of that? Um, in Ukraine, after a few days, it looked like this. And um, it, it completely changed the work and changed the space. And the women now were standing in this kind of um, very chaotic uh, scene, but they were standing kind of resilient in this scene. Um, I ended up winning a prize for this work in this uh, installation of it. And it struck me as um, one of these hypocrisies, I think, that we face as Black women in these white spaces trying to make work for our communities and then and then you know like how do we do that in spaces that are in it in it so tied to uh white supremacy and capitalism and misogyny and all of these things so if you're endorsed by the, those gatekeepers for doing something subversive what does that do to the subversion so i i from that point on i've never done it like that again this is it in um, Venice for the Biennale. Um, it was in a palazzo and it was just, just a much more kind of grand affair. Um, but instead of doing that, I placed um, in a separate room um, the ability for uh, the audience to go and have a private mo moment and record and self record and then their voices go straight into the floor. So they're still having an active response to the work but it's no longer this kind of punk thing because you can't be a punk in, in an institution like that so um so then uh moving on from that as an extension i was thinking of 
um, Adrian Piper's Food for the Spirit and how she um, uh, writ herself into the world and what she was thinking when she was doing that. So I asked women if they would um, adopt the pose and um, think about what it means to stand in their own skin and stand in their own bodies and uh, self-author um, a photograph. Uh, inside the um, inside the apparatus, the phone camera, um, is a hand-drawn uh, QR code. And each woman has uh, complete access to that code so they can program it to whatever they want you to read or hear or watch while you're looking at them. Um, they also self-title the work. Um, and uh, so it becomes this kind of living work that I had an involvement in, but, but my presence as the artist kind of falls away. Um, and, and I mean, to this day, some it's in storage now, but, but at any point, these women can change um, what they want to say through this work. So it becomes kind of a vestibule. I don't know. I don't know what the word is. Um, very soon after that, um, I had a bad trauma to my eye um, and I lost uh, the sight of it. This was a piece called New Moon, which is actually a um, footage of the surgery I had, one of the surgeries I had to try and save my eye. Um, uh, it knocked me out completely. I ended up in this kind of wild state of panic and confusion and not knowing who I was and um, it ended up being uh, so traumatic that my heart physically broke and um, and I, I cancelled everything and I kind of just wanted to uh, not be you know like I, I was like I'll never make work again um, uh, and and then, and so art making started to take on this very different vibe to me and a very different meaning for me. Um, uh, I started to use drawing just to be able to try and recognize myself again. Um, so I was doing it kind of as a ritual practice just for my own uh, sanity. Um, uh, this is, uh, and then, and I'm thinking a lot right now about care and about the ecosystem of care that I think is required to house our work. And when that care isn't met, um, what happens to the subjectivity that we, um, that we put into the world? So, um, so one, of the, one of the most amazing things of that time while I was having this kind of really uh, horrific, uh, emotional kind of state, um, I had a conversation with uh, Renee Masai, who is a, a curator in London at, at Watercraft. And we, we've been planning to have this, um, to do a show together, but then all, everything happened. And she was just so gentle and so knowledgeable and so knowing and so healing. And she held everything that I was feeling uh, so, um, so warmly that uh, that we, be we began to slowly talk about what it means to make this healing work and how this healing work could potentially be generative um, on a, you know, not just for my own kind of healing, but it could kind of go further out into the world. Um, they, get, they ended up giving me the space uh, for my own use for 21 days. Um, and I drew this horizon line and every day I photographed myself in whatever state I was in um, and um, I started to draw myself onto this horizon. I wasn't sure what it was going to become um, uh, and it was such a cathartic thing for me. Um, it's in willow charcoal, soft willow charcoal, so it's really fragile. Um, you could blow it and it would go away and that was important to me because I wanted, um, I, I'd lost a lot of trust uh, uh, during this process, this thing. And um, so this was about kind of how, how you know, if I give this to you, uh, will you look after it? And as, as, as a side product, will you look after me? Um, and so it was a very healing uh, moment. Um, I, at some point I started thinking about my younger self and like, 
uh, how she didn't deserve any of this to happen to her. And I had this thought about this photograph and I wasn't sure if it was real or if it was imagined. So I drew this picture that was in my head and I sent it to my sister and she immediately sent me this. And I was like, okay, it did exist. So this became the kind of anchor of the work. Um, oh, I don't know if you can see it, it says it on that side of the thing. And this was the final, the final work. Um, ha sh shall I stop? <laughs> I feel like I've been going on. <laughs> I feel like I've been going on a lot. <laughs> uh, maybe take a knee for now. And then uh, I'm sure in the, in the process of us coming back together to have our conversation yeah. that um, no. you may want to show more. Yeah. Of course, the doorbell would bloody ring. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to quickly introduce Jamia. This person can wait. And Jamia Richmond Edwards creates mixed media collages utilizing a variety of papers and hand-drawn elements. Her work focuses on Black Americana and the intersection of Indigenous American identity. I'm going to say that again and focuses on Black Americana and the intersection of indigenous American identity. That's important. I suspect we'll come back to it. Born and raised in Detroit, Michigan, Richmond Edwards graduated from a bachelor's of arts degree from, I'm sorry, with a bachelor's of art degrees from Jackson State University in 2004, where she studied painting and drawing and went on to earn an MFA in painting from Howard University, HU. I'm just, I would like someone in the comments to say, you know, if you, you know, thank you. <laughs> in 2012, she's a recipient of the 2019 Joan Mitchell Painters and Sculptors Award and a 2020 Joan Mitchell Artist in Residence. Mm -hmm. Jamia has exhibited her work nationally and internationally, including the California African American Museum, Charles Wright Museum in Detroit, and Kravitz Webby Gallery in New York. Her work is included in the collections of the Studio Museum of Harlem and the Rubel Family Collection. She currently resides in Maryland with her husband and three sons. I'm so excited to have you here, Jamia. Thank you for saying yes. Also, Phoebe, I mean, like, if you had continued, I probably would have cried, so I probably also needed you to take a minute. I mean, I cry every episode. I think it's a thing now, it's fine. Um, Jamia, I'm giving you the spotlight. Alrighty. Um, Tiffany, Phoebe, like, I'm, I'm just really speechless. Um, <laughs> hard acts to follow. Um, uh, no. Um, thank you for the invitation and, um, let me share my screen with you guys. Hold on one second. All right. Can y'all see this? Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So I realized I gave um, her the short version of my bio. So this would be a really a great opportunity to um, to frame how I want you guys to see my work and to contextualize it. Um, so before I, I go into the work, I want to just kind of break down how I'm thinking about the work and just to give some context. Born in 1982, which is of course, the crack epidemic and AIDS epidemic, which not only shaped my family, but really shaped my community. Um, so as we look through the works, you know, you, you guys will see um, a bit of all of this inside of it. Um, I chose this image of this uh, beautiful woman with her hair laid because my first introduction to aesthetics and art growing up in Detroit um, was through hair and um, clothing. Detroit was, may still, I have, I've been out of the loop, was known as the hair capital. Um, ATL was always the, the runner up, uh, but we, our, our hair was, um, was very essential in terms of how we, we moved, identity. Um, I have the biggie here because growing up in the 90s, the, you know, um, bad boy, um, no limit began to, sh to shape a, a, a very specific aesthetic. And 
I he I chose this image of him in a Kooji sweater because that was like the the Detroit staple was the Kooji and alligator shoes. Um, I did a snapshot of this, um, and as Phoebe mentioned, like who 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 gets to tell history, right? Um, and oftentimes when we're talking about American history, a lot of things are swept in a rug. And I I I post a screenshot of this racial cleansing that happened in the early 1900s because my great grandfather, um, he, he fled. And so this is where literally all the, the white residents of um, Forsyth County, Georgia, literally chased out the black residents. Um, so from there, my grandfather, my great grandfather went to Alabama and then we came to Detroit. So I'm, I'm, contextualizing this because there's a level of um, generational trauma that's happening, right? Um, and I wanted to talk about the Racial Integrity Act, which is really essential, but really not talked about a lot when we talking about Black um, American history or history in general. And this is in 1924. Um, my last name is Richmond, my maiden name, my family, my one side of my family is from Virginia. Um, the Racial Integrity Act is when um, Walter Plecker literally reclassified the um, indigenous, the, the indigenous people in that particular state as Negro. Um, so we, we talk about genocides, but there's also paper genocides. There's many types of genocides, including paper genocides. Um, I wanted to, I'm going to do a real quick um, play of this because when I, I, so I attended Jackson State University, the HBCU in Jackson, Mississippi, I marched in a band. So I marched in college, um, high school, middle school, and as you see my work, you will see some of those principles, um, that I've, you know, that I've, I've, I, I learned through marching band. And so I just want to give you like a 30 second clip of just swag, right? And this is where I had the pri privilege of marching for three years of my life. Um, Okay, yeah, so I, I just wanted to play just a, a hot second of that. Um, and you will see the, the aesthetic, the vibe, the, the, the energy, the rhythm of it. Um, I also wanna show you this quick clip of Chicago stepping. So I grew up um, born and raised in Detroit. My mother um, was, is a social dancer. And part of me seeing my mother going out on the weekend, getting ready for this, this ritual of going out dancing with her peers is the this act of like coordination. So my mother will co coordinate her outfit with her partners, which often coordinated with their Cadillac. And so I just want to give you guys this quick clip. These two brothers, Chicago stepping in Detroit. Um, but I want you to pay attention to everybody because this is an all white party. And so this is this community coming together, dressed in their finest, um, you know, their finest clothing and watching, uh, come dancing with each other and just watching some, 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 uh oh, sorry, goodness, some quality work. Um, sorry, let me go back, y'all. All right, here we go. Let's play that again. Uh, All right, so so you guys, this is this is you get the vibe of it, right? Um, but I love seeing this video because it's an all white party and everyone is coordinated. Um, this is a picture I I I, I pulled from the um, the Library of Congress, and this is a, a it's, it's a Choctaw man. That's the the title of the piece. Um, and oftentimes when we talk about indigenous Americans, uh, we don't 
get to see your copper colored or your dark skin indigenous people. Um, and so these are the things I'm thinking about in my work. And I have to put this picture up over here because, you know, growing up in the Midwest and you, you saw it on the East Coast as well, minks, <laughs> jewelry, the finest clothing, um, you know, materialism, that was all part of my upbringing. So I'm gonna just comb through my work real quick. Um, this piece right here is titled Wings Not Meant to Fly. And I wanted to show this painting because I did this while at Howard University. Um, and I remember going, getting a critique of this piece in 2010 or 11, 2011. And whoever critiquing it was just like, oh, it's too much going on, you know, paint over it. Um, and this piece wound up being on um, Empire. And, you know, it, it Empire had opened up so many opportunities for me because it, it really introduced my work to a larger to a larger audience. Um, um, this is a painting of the Seven Mile Girls and I'm just gonna comb through it and you see the Kuji motif, right? That's the Kuji sweater. Um, this piece is called Girl with Green Alligator Bag Next to a Mannequin. And I did this piece, uh, let me see, two years ago? Two years ago, this is my first solo um, New York show. And this was, in, this, the, the exhibition was titled Fly Girl, Fly. And it just really talked about my relationship to luxury items. Um, oftentimes when I would purchase or acquire luxury items, I would purchase them from a booster um, growing up in Detroit. And so, you know, as Tiffany was saying earlier, when we talk about you know, how our stories are told when we go into museums and we look on television. I don't see often my story, right? So I decided, okay, if we're gonna talk about luxury items and, and brands, you know, we gotta talk about boosting. Um, <laughs> so I did this painting. Um, I noticed she's standing next to a headless mannequin, a white headless mannequin. And for me, I wanted to do that because often, in my opinion, I feel that when we talk about the Black American experience or Black American aesthetics, we, also, we too often frame it um, through the lens of, you know, being colonized or through white supremacy. And my thing is like, you know, sometimes we, we're, co we're colorful people. And when I was in Detroit, Detroit is a very Black city, we really weren't thinking about what <laughs> the white folks is doing in and you know blooming um bloomingdale um or um you know other parts of michigan we really wasn't um and so yeah this piece right here is titled bag lady um just to give you guys an idea of my process this is primarily collage um the faces are drawn with ink and charcoal and the rest is um um, handmade paper, paper that I'm purchasing from the, um, you know, the store, paper that's donated to me, old students' artwork. Instead of trashing it, I'll, you know, cut it up. People donate, have donated their students' artwork, teachers. Um, so these paintings is, they're, they're paintings, but they have a history, right? And oftentimes I cut up old paintings that I've done and I'll put, put it in a painting. Um, this piece right here is called Archetype of a Five Star, and for those of you who aren't familiar with that reference, um, Five Star, and it's, Trina had a son called Five Star Bitch, and, um, when I look at her, you know, I look at her as the chick that got it going on, you know, um, <laughs> when, in terms of my color palette, so this is the work that, I would say if you like follow my trajectory, this is the work that I've always wanted to make. And I do have to talk about the, um, the influence of, you know, coming through Howard University and studying up under um, Akili Ron Anderson, James Phillips and Al Smith. Um, Al Smith is an Afro-Cobra, but um, James Phillips and Akili Ron Anderson is, and they really, um, I, I see it now in my work, the, ins the inspiration from 
um, that collective. And so, yeah. It's, Sorry, it's, can you talk about that in case people don't know what you're talking about? Yes. Yeah, so, um, for, so those of you who are familiar, familiar, excuse me, Afrocobra is a artist collective that was created in the sixties by Jeff Donaldson. Um, and this, they, they are a collective, they're still going. So it's, it's not a was, um, but if you look up their work, they have, they, J Donaldson, um, they created a, a, a very specific aesthetic and a list of principles that went alongside that aesthetic. And one of those principles being, you know, the colors had to be Kool-Aid colors. Um, and so um, very vibrant colors. And when I look at my work, I, I, I see that. What's interesting is when you think of, um, when you look at the work of Afrocobra, their influence was jazz, right? It's interesting, jazz was the soundtrack of that, that, that movement, um, that aesthetic. And for me, when I look at my work, I see techno. So coming up in Detroit is the birth home of techno music. And, um, and it's just really the past year where I'm just like making the connection. So also growing up in the nineties, that's, that's, that was my baseline. That's what I listened to was techno and house music. And I, I see that. <laughs> um, notice, okay. So this piece was done last year, 2019. This was one of the first pieces I created in 2020. And the title of this piece is the red bone who can make rain. Um, so I had did a residency, um, Wasaig residency in New York, and it was just a two week residency. And I realized I won't be able to do one of my large scale paintings. And just for reference, this painting right here is six feet by six feet. Uh, my pieces tend to be pretty monumental. Well, I describe them as monumental. So before this residency, I made my work was in black and white and I felt really compelled to work in color, like literally create color girls. And I realized with me beginning to add color to them, it's, it opens up a whole, uh, a whole other layer of um, dialogue. So I, I, you know, I tell the story when I first left Detroit and went to Jackson, Mississippi for college, people would ask me, or they would ask me if I'm either Creole or they'll say, oh, are you a red bone? Or they say, no, you're a red bone. And I'm like, what? I've never heard, I never heard that term prior to going down south. Um, and what I discovered <laughs> was that um, Red Bones is actually a tribe that started in, I believe, the South Carolina, one of the Carolinas, I think South Carolina, and they migrated. Um, and many of them uh, kind of settled in Louisiana and other parts of the, the, the Southeast. But um, I realized that they, when people saw me, they were kind of placing me, identifying me because I have very red features. And so um, I titled this piece, The Red Bone Who Can Make Rain, because now um, through the history of my family, there's, there's always been this sort of um, narrative or like this very folklore of, of us having powers, right? And so, um, my sister, my sister who's 13 years older than me, she was actually struck by lightning, <laughs> literally struck by lightning and nothing happened to her, okay, nothing. And so, you know, my family's interpretation of that, I wanted to put that in paintings because going back to what Tiffany said, oftentimes we don't see ourselves within a very metaphysical, in a very metaphysical space. Um, so I want to put that there. Uh, this piece is Girl with Two Orbs, and I'm going to fast forward. I don't want to spend too much time. Um, these are still the black and white girls, two sisters, and a horned serpent. Um, I forget the name of this piece. This is, piece is called The Girl Slaying a, a, a Horned Serpent. So right now, this is the 2020 work, and, you know, just incorporating the colors. And I'm, I'm, I'm really having a, a good time with it. Um, this is the girl on the serpent throne. This is my, one of my favorite pieces. And for this piece, this is eight feet by six feet. Yeah, eight feet by six feet. And um, this was in a solo um, show that I had this past December called Prom Night. But this is the first time 
in a painting that I'm intentionally incorporating um, symbolism from the Southeast. And um, if you, you know, study uh, indigenous American art in the Southeast, uh, you will find that the horned serpent is a, is a reappear, it reappears throughout the Southeast. Um, and I felt really compelled to incorporate that in my, in my work. Um, this pay, this the the title of this exhibition was called Prom Night because I was really interested in rites of passage for Black Americans, um, the, the the sort of coming of age ritual that we do, and oftentimes we were criticized like, oh, prom, y'all spent too much money on prom and graduation, um, but you know, just growing up off a of seven mile, that's that's what we do, and it's really important. Where I've seen parents. Um, you know, bankroll their child's prom and they don't have, you know, a lot of money, but it was about, you know, their, this is the first time that the child gets to choose their dress and, and coming up in Detroit, we designed our own dresses. Like that was part of this rites of passage. Um, you get to rent your car, you get to, you know, all these things. And um, as I began, I noticed about two years ago, this is around the Met Gala, um, you know, you see the beautiful pictures floating around of the celebrities, but then I start seeing pictures of high schoolers, uh, like on uh, on Shade Room, and it's Shade Room Prime, and I'm like, damn, these kids are like fly as hell, okay? Uh, and I, I was really inspired by that, because I'm like, yo, these kids are writing history, because, you know, 100 years from now, and we scrolling through the archives of the internet, we're going to see these kids that come from, you know, maybe low income areas, but they are straight up glam royalty. So I was really, um, really inspired by that. And I'm gonna fast forward. So this is another one of my pieces, one of my favorite pieces. Um, and this was Prom Queen. I don't often um, do men, you know, why? I mean, I, I haven't fully worked that out yet, uh, but occasionally they'll, you know, they'll appear in my work. So this is the, the Kang, the prom Kang, um, Fly Girls and Fly Whips. This piece was, what, eight feet by hmm, 12 feet. This piece was called Lace um, Shirt and, um, this was a whole booster setup. So, you know, she's in the basement of their home. They're looking at the viewer, you know, they're kind of gaming her a little bit. Um, but I wanted to create the scene of what it may look like in the booster's home, you know, and this is me pulling from my memory back in 99 and 2000, going downstairs or, you know, oftentimes you have boosters come to the beauty salon and they'll pull out their, their goods. Um, this is another piece I did, and I want to actually stop right here. Um, so this piece is called No Games Played, and this is six feet by 12 feet. Uh, I hurried up and clipped it from the internet. Sorry, the, um, the quality of it. But um, this is the, the first piece I created post, um, post Rona. <laughs> I had went on a hiatus for about two, um, two months. Yeah, went on a hiatus for two months from creating because I was just really depressed and down. And I, you know, I went to my studio and tried to create this painting. But um, for me, this reminded me of growing up and, you know, we would have barbecues and my mother and my, my aunts. And, you know, they would go in the backyard and they would play beer with or they would play spades. But um, I also imagined this as a convening of sorts, them plotting, because oftentimes when the adults would go in the backyard and play spades or whatever it is they're doing, dominoes, the kids, y'all had to go somewhere else. So this is an opportunity. So this is more than leisure. This is about building. Um, yeah, and I feel right now my work is, as I mentioned earlier, is, is moving into this, this, this very metaphysical, meta, metaphysical space 
I thought I had another painting in here, but I guess I didn't incorporate it. One of my newer pieces. Um, yeah, I'll stop. I'll stop right there. Amazing. Thank you. Um, so we're going to gallery view this thing. Um, so everyone unmute yourselves. And again, everyone, um, screenshots, because you know we love screenshots. Um, also, uh, please tag us. I think most of you know what mine is, but I will put it in the comments. Also, uh, everyone, if you could place your websites as well as Instagram handles for folks to follow you and follow your work. Um, so, Jamia. Yeah. I have a question for you. Um, and I asked you this question before, so you, but I feel like you're probably going to have a different answer now. Okay. So about uh, three years ago, almost exactly three years ago, um, okay. the show, uh, actually my very first concept, my very first exhibition concept, Black Magic, Afro Pasts, Afro Futures. Um, so we were able to do another iteration of that show in DC at On Fleur Gallery in Southeast DC in Anacostia. And I was so uh, privileged to be able to show Jamia's work in that show. And so a lot of what we just saw that you just showed was faces. We've spoken to both Tiffany and Phoebe about the faces and the bodies that they're showing is often referencing images that exist. But for you, that's not always the case. So I'm always like, you can't technically like in a dream, you can't see a face that you've never seen. So I'm just always like, but where are these faces coming from? Yeah. Um, so I, I, I just draw the faces. And what's interesting is I've been drawing the same faces over and over. And I recycle the same faces. And oftentimes people will say that they look like me or they look like people in my family. Um, so I, they're not anyone in particular. However, I do know those faces. <laughs> you know what I mean? I do know those faces where there's been times where I'll, you know, be walking through the city or in New York somewhere and I'm like, oh shoot, I, I, I drew her. <laughs> or I'm staring at people and I'm like, damn, you look familiar. So um, I, you know, how I view art now, I feel that oftentimes we're pulling things out of the ether. So it, it exists. <laughs> it exists. I'm just, um, I'm just a vessel for it. So no one in particular, but they're, they're all of us at the same time. Love that. Um, let me see. There's a question that was just added. That was more specific. Okay. We'll come back to that later. Cause I would like for all of us to be in conversation together. And most of the questions that are currently in the Q and A are directed to specific persons. So please friends, if you have other questions for everyone, please go ahead and drop those into the Q and A. So I'm just thinking about um, what we've heard from all of you individually. For me, the, the areas of overlap is really thinking about this notion of pushing against this dominant narrative of like what people think black art and black life is supposed to look like. Um, and I think it's a really lovely way that each of you have approached responding to that. I want to, I want to ask you why drawing? Like why these specific engagements with figuration? For me, I would say that, um, you, I mean, the, the answer, the, the simple answer to that is why not, right? Um, but the other answer to that is how I'm working is, as I think when we talk about like Western art, I'm, so I also have a background in education, right? And I think that typically when we talk about art, it has to be through, we, painting is the, and no shade to painting because I was a painter and I, 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 I want to go back to painting sometimes, um, but painting is like the epitome of what it's supposed to be, right? Like oil painting and over the years, I've had to fight against my urge to question my process of using, you know, a variety of materials or using Kool-Aid colors. Um, and oftentimes, one of my inspirations that I look to is, um, is folk art, is folk art. And when I, you know, oftentimes, I, 
the first thing people ask you, where did you go to school, right? And where did you train? I went to Jackson State. I went to Howard University. But really who trained me was the collectives that I was part of. And so one of the first collectives, art collectives I was part of was a Baya in, in, in Milwaukee led by Della Wells. And for those of you who don't know, is um, Della Wells is a folk artist, um, an activist. She's really amazing. I lived in Milwaukee for three years. Um, but with that being in that group, many of the, the artists in that space were folk artists. And I, that was my first time um, being around folk artists, but I realized they didn't have borders. There was so many, there was such, it was such a range and possibility of what, you know, the, how the human figure can be conveyed. So I would say that they empowered me to, to approach it through a more um, stylized tone to um, to be okay with using markers and even use crayons. And that's to, from how I was brought up. It was just like, oh no, that's like, no, <laughs> that's low level, whatever, however you want to look at it. Um, but I've, I've been, you know, pushing against that. So you know, I'm drawing now with, with adding the colors, I'm using markers. I would have never <laughs> thought of using markers. So it's just like having that space and agency to create how, however I feel, you know? Thank you. Anybody else? Um, I would agree. And I, I think for me, drawing is, Firstly, I've always drawn. I've never not drawn. And when I went to learn, learn uh, art, and I was taught figuration very much with the British canon of British figurative painters like Lucian Freud, um, I I realized over time that I was like actually just drawing with paint. Like I wasn't enjoying the painterly painterness of paint. Um, I kept reverting back to um, the immediacy of drawing and the kind of, what, what I love about drawing is, uh, is that it doesn't take much to do it. Like you can do it so easily and quickly, you always have a pencil or like something to mark a page. Uh, and, um, and so there's something quite very primordial about that. Um, it kind of transcends time, um, it transcends geographies, you know, I, I'm, when I go visit my folks in, in Zanzibar and I'm on the beach with these kids uh, and they are, uh, they, like if they want to explain something, they'll grab a stick and they'll draw it in the sand and like, I just think that, that you know, that if, 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 if it can be something that we, that, that there's no barrier of understanding um, uh, it's a level of communication that, that I enjoy um, and it also uh, like a mark on a page can be a drawing but it can also be super technical and I like the challenge as well so um, it's always the starting point um, and the heart of, of even when I make a, a, a video work um, it always starts with drawing. Awesome, thank you. Tiffany? Um, I don't know, cause I'm, like I said, I'm a painter originally. So like drawing right now for me, it's, um, it's kind of like trying to perfect my skills um, to better them. It's also like play around. Um, some sometimes I just warm up by sketching random stuff just by moving your hand with it um yeah I don't know because <laughs> um I'm coming from like a, a different um experience but for me I feel like drawing it just captures a lot of freedom like you could just do whatever and it's okay if it looks crazy you can erase it or yeah um and i also feel like growing up i've i've always seen like a lot of major artists just drawing like growing up also i had like these two really huge portraits of me and my sister in pencil drawing and i always felt like wow that, like those are masterpieces and i don't know it just that always stuck with me like seeing that so 
I always incorporate it to like real art, like something like Jamia said, like, oh, you would never see um like like high quality art with like markers or or crayons or something like that. And I kinda I get that, you know? <laughs> but yeah, that's just how I see it. Like um growing up I would see like drawings and I would just think it was really like a professional um way of expressing the art. Brilliant. Um, I'm going to pose a question that I actually think works for all of you. I think this question was put here during Tiffany's segment earlier. Um, would you please talk about the use of space and architectural elements? I mean, the architectural part isn't necessarily applicable to all of you, but I do think your use of space um, a, across what we've seen from all of you is really interesting. So I would love to hear each of you talk about that. Um, for me, I love space. Um, I love feeling like I'm the only, not me like personally, but like having just like a subject in a big space um, is like a sense of, I don't know. It's just like, it's just something more to talk about. It's like, you're just in the spotlight. Um, and that's what I like intend on doing with my work. I want to make the brown figure the spotlight instead of having it in a in a bad um, connotation, like it's in a negative connotation, you know? So that's why I like to use space a lot, to emphasize the figure a lot. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, Are you, sorry. That's okay, go ahead. Did you have like more thoughts um and also architecture because i saw that it said architecture there um again like just like from my culture i have there's like a lot of patterns um a lot of foliage a lot of like gates and that's just that's just where i come from that's just what i've seen um so i always like to incorporate a lot of things that i grew up with um yeah and it's just relatable to um caribbean descent or Afro descent. So uh, what I wanted to say with regard to that element that you just mentioned in terms of picturing the figure in the space primarily, I think so much of the sort of our historical canon has not been that. Mm -hmm. And it's been, you know, persons of color relegated to literally the periphery of the canvas to uh, literally people who are servants or enslaved that mm -hmm. sort of thing so yeah. i mean you might not be directly thinking about that but i th i think i see that also and this is just a general pattern that i think is is the case for many of the painters who are working to a figuration in this moment mm -hmm. it's it's a specific like push against that particular element in our historical canon yeah anybody else Um, so for me, I, I, I have a lot, my work is, is I, I'm a maximalist at this m moment in my life. I would have never even thought that. Um, and I feel that, you know, looking at the work of Afrocobra, even when you look at like the, just the history of black art and even thinking of somebody like, uh, Charles Bibbs, you know, like there, it's a, it's a lot of, um, the 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 compositions are very full even thinking of um charles white or, or excuse me is it charles white yeah it's charles white um they're full and i part of me i like the challenge of just like all right let's put it in there and let's see how i can work myself work myself out of it um even of thinking of oh i'm i'm drawing a blank what's the artist bernie from um, Good Times, Bernie. Ernie Barnes. Bar yes, Ernie Barnes. Um, just even looking at his work, it was, it was, the compositions were really full. They were really busy, lots of movement. So, um, you know, that's what's inspiring me. And I'm also thinking in terms of like the music, the, the clothing, I see, I see that energy 
and uh, when I go to Harlem or when I go to Detroit or Southeast DC. And so I'm, I'm, I'm mimicking that. I'm putting that out there. Um, even thinking in terms of my closet or my mother's closet, where you see all the textures, her sequins, her leathers, her minks, and, you know, so I'm just regurgitating that, um, that, that, that energy back out and, you know, going to these, these principles that Africa over had, you know, they call that being jam tight like just keeping it real, real tight. And, you know, when you just think in terms of Black American expression, music, food, gumbos, um, that that, ener that energy is there. So that's what I, I like in how I, I, I'm utilizing or thinking about the space. Um, so this is kind of a piggyback really quick. Maria also asked if you have considered some of your paintings as tapestry. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And now that I've opened up, like I've, I've have, I'm calling myself sovereign at this point, but it's also like sovereign in my art practice where I, I'm seeing the possibilities, you know? Um, so yes, absolutely. I'm, I'm there. I'm absolutely there. Fantastic. Um, uh, Phoebe? Um, so about space. Yeah, I was gonna ask if you needed the question again. Oh, um, no, I'm super excited by space <laughs> and by architectural everything. Um, I always find it very difficult to stay in a frame. I'd always want the drawing to go off the frame or out of the frame. Um, uh, I think that I, one thing that, that excites me a lot is the bodily experience of work. So you're not just standing idle in front of a work, but you feel your body um, in association with the work. Um, I want you to place yourself there. So I want it to be an immersive situation where you, um, where you, you know, you're comfortable or you're uncomfortable in that space. Um, and you, yeah, like you, you, you have an experience according to your, to your body and you bring your lived experience to that work. So space is um, essential and a lot of decision making around my work happens at the install phase. Um, this is something that over time I've become more confident about that, um, that I know that there are going to be some unknowns until I arrive in a space and that that's okay because that that is a necessary um, negotiation that has to be had there so there's so the conversation between me and the space then feeds into the conversation the space then has with, with the audience so um yeah i never i very rarely don't think about space and when and i very rarely yeah um yeah, it, like, it, it freaks me out to, to, to like to have an to have a place where you're where you're um where you don't know how you're gonna where your work is gonna be seen and and how it's gonna be hung and that kind of stuff. Well, I also really loved something that you said um, during your bit there. Uh, this idea of being endorsed by gatekeepers while you're doing subversive work like does that make the work subversive still if it's being embraced in a certain way i think that's a really um powerful question particularly in this moment where you know okay you've made your little cute declaration about caring about black lives how do we see that jamia <laughs> sorry I mean, I would have at least liked for you to have laughed like with your sound on. <laughs> like, don't be snatching our wigs like that. Um, look, I mean, no, it's if real. You're for nothing, watching these, I think everybody knows that I'm into the wig snatching. It's kind of a thing. Come on, let's let's snatch it. Let's snatch it. Um, <laughs> yeah, for it, it's fine. You don't get anywhere if you're not snatching a wig or two. Come on now. Um, anyway, but in seriousness, I'm thinking about. And also um, that that other anecdote that you shared about the critique of of 
your painting of your sister. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, and I think also Tiffany, for you, your experiences at SVA, you've mentioned a lot um, and just feeling not necessarily welcomed and, and mm -hmm. sort of seen in a certain way. And I think Jamia, because you were at an HBCU, you may not necessarily have had that exact experience, but you did share something about a particular, that particular work, the first work that you shared with us. And I just wonder about what you think about that. Like, do you feel like, because I'm, I hear so often when I speak to people, different people maybe in MFA programs or, or like different statuses as students or artists in the world and just people responding to your work in a certain way, like that's, it's, it's a tricky and, and it could be tricky, but it could also be really powerful if, if the person is looking and gazing with you in mind rather than themselves in mind. Does that make sense? This is like a weird, I'm trying to get, figure out what my question is here. Well, this is the thing. I think you're speaking in terms of the paradox of being like living in a black or brown body, right? <laughs> so we have it to work at spaces, um, working on a plantation or however you want to view it and still having to serve your masters. You know what I mean? Um, and that's, that's, that's a very loaded statement, but I mean, that's, that's, that's real. And you look at this moment where you see, this is a moment where we, it's, it's loaded, where we are putting out manifestos. So these are real live people who have to work in these spaces. Like as soon as we walk in, we recognize when we walk in museums, we recognize this ain't for us. Yeah. Um, so for me, I'm just, I want to free myself up with that. And, um, you know, coming through, coming, live, growing up in a very black city, going to historically black colleges, my first, you know, six years of being represented was I was represented by a black gallery. So I never even, even thought outside of like <laughs> that, my safe space. Right. And so, you know, me being immersed within the, the sort of mainstream or New York art world the past couple of years, I'm barely thinking about that. And it's like, it's just, it's too much weight to put on us. And I just feel like, yo, this is our profession. We spent the, many of us spent a lot of money investing in this, this career, let us create. And you know, how, how it moves, it moves. But I think the most important part is us having these conversations, the artists having a voice to, to be able to contextualize it. Um, and I think in 2020, it's freed us up a little bit more to, to, to articulate ourselves, to articulate, you know, um, the nuances of being, of being Black. So is it subversive? Yes, it's subversive because we said it's subversive. If you, if you want it to be subversive, it is. And, um, and I saw Alexandria's um, question and maybe we can we can get to that, but that also feeds into do you feel this you know the specificity of figuration and painting does it further marginalize black people in their system it does it's not good enough in in their system so at one point when do we because many of us are on both sides of the fence <laughs> you know what I'm saying like myself um, at some point we got to say forget it because the black art in America. Instagram page looks very different from art in America or art news page. And it's a lot of it is figuration. A lot of, a lot of it is very, it, it's, it's a very specific aesthetic. And I feel like we just need to embrace it. Get fit in where you, get in where you fit in. And I just hope that we can kind of free ourselves from that boogeyman. <laughs> you know what I mean? That, that white boogeyman to say, okay, am I, you know, um, am I'm doing too much or am I'm not doing enough? And it's just like, can we just be, you know, while disrupting, while shaking things up, while being vocal, we could still, you know, exhibit in their spaces and still be about that, that life or about black liberation. Um, so I think it's, you know, it, it only becomes, it's subversive if we say it's subversive. I'm sorry if I'm go going on a tangent, but it's all good. Yeah. We have the tangents, it's fine. Um, Phoebe, I'm also thinking about you and, and just this idea that the work is not confined to like a, 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 a box in a way, in the way that 
drawing has been and just thinking about like what it means to break out of what again would be a canonical way of approaching drawing where it takes up a very sort of finite amount of space mm -hmm. and i think in some ways that of course how you're integrating all of these other elements sound video is revolutionary and i wonder about your thoughts on that as well um i th i think that um i agree with jamea we have to you know we we have to free our own hearts to, in order to just continue to make work. But I think that we also have to think about um, the wider, you know, the wider stuff. I'm, I'm reading a lot right now about abolition. Like that is something that um, we have to de determine what we're willing to lose, you know, like if we're part of this system and we're, fe we're, we're you know, being fed by it, whether we have existential crises every day about it or not, we're still part of it. And we have to decide for ourselves how, you know, like, and I think it's a very interesting time because we're being called upon more. I don't know, like in, in the UK, we're far behind <laughs> in terms of, of um, discourse about race. So we get called upon now all the time, you know, like by institutions, and, need us to speak on this moment and, it, and you, I, I think it's about having firstly a, a, a critical literacy to be able to know when you're being used or when your voice is being co-opted in a way that um, yeah. is perverse um, and know when that uh, is going to be helpful for the communities that you wish to make work for and know when you can use leverage to kind of change these spaces and, and when it's just lip service. And I think that this is a really kind of murky ground. Um, but one of the reasons why I, I, I try to, whether subconsciously or not, try and not pin my work into any kind of, you know, that's a recognizable Phoebe Boswell. And so that has a commodifiable aspect to it that then you become just a commodity and, and, um, and uh, just in my, like, I would feel very stifled by that. And also I think that when, um, when institutions or galleries um, uh, commit to showing my work, they commit to giving me space and, and, and that negotiation happens early enough to know that you know it's not you're i'm not going to be shoved in a corner just to fulfill a quota because it requires more space than that say that again <laughs> um uh i'm totally yeah. serious oh, do you, I, you want me to uh -huh. what <laughs> i'm serious i'm serious um yeah no I, like i i need to this there needs to be a commitment and a level of commitment before you say before um, a gallery or an institution says yes i'm right now with a with a with a non-black gallery in in new york they i i joined with them uh just when my eye actually happened like we started conversing just before and um, and then when everything happened and it shifted and they were actually just so kind of decent and um, really beautiful about the whole thing and um, and it's been a it's been a great relationship but this has obviously tested us as well because I'm like okay so you're now selling work that relates to black subjectivity so what are you doing now like and and so these are conversations that need to be had on an intimate level and on, made on a wider level. Um, I'm working on a project which I'm not allowed to tell you about now, but you're going to know about it in a couple of weeks. Um, but it speaks very, very much about um, my misgivings about this moment. But the main thing is that we protect ourselves by becoming as uh, critically literate. Um, and then we care for each other in that, you know. Brilliant. Tiffany, did you have something you wanted to add as well? Um, I just feel like, I don't know, <laughs> um, the topic of like, just like everything, Black Lives Matter, the Black Lives Matter movement, I just feel like 
is is very performative for a lot of people now. Um, it's like, is the support always been there? Or is this coming to light right now? Um, is the support gonna continue after the movement? Like, what's that gonna look like? So it leaves me with a lot of questions. Um, and questioning like how genuine it is, you know? Um, but yeah, that's um, also something like how we were speaking about like what I faced in school. I I didn't get um, a lot of attention from my work, um, but now of course, you know, now <laughs> everybody's joining the wave. And yeah, so it's, it's just, it just leaves me with a lot of questions, you know? Interesting. I don't know. I, I'm like, I don't, I don't want to leave you there. I'm like trying to think. Well, I, but I, what she just said really kind of brought something just really kind of sparked in me is once she left school is when she sort of received the respect and community and feedback that she wanted. And I really have to emphasize that as we shift into whatever this is, we're shifting it to, we have to acknowledge that at the end of the day, they may not acknowledge us or, you know, treat us rude, but what are we going to do? Like, what's the commitment? What's our pledge to one another? How are we going to move? We can't focus on them. And, and that also includes many of our institutions. And I just have to really put out there, you know, I had my first collective experience um, with Abaya in Milwaukee, then Black Artists of D.C., that's how I was taught, like, the fundamentals of running a business. So I would say of all six years of art education, two years, two, three years of, you know, education, um, you know, going to school for that as well, no one ever taught me or many of my peers about the fundamentals of business, right? And so, but what she's, what Tiffany is saying is, that community, the, the community, water reaches its own level. The people are going to track to you, you know, come to you. They're going to support you. And that just shows like how, how are we going to show up for one another? And oftentimes how we show up is going to be outside of their constructs, their institutions, their school, their models. Um, so as we build a more equitable world and space, it, it all falls on, on us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Love that. Yeah. <laughs> um, now, I guess perhaps we can turn to that question. Also, speaking of equity, before I do that, before I read that question, I really love that, that hand-drawn QR code um, element that you mentioned. Oh, okay. Phoebe, like, just so brilliant and really just offering so much agency to those women because, you know, people will pose for something and then that's the extent of their involvement often. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're not cut into the profit of, on that work. There's not, you know, all of these other things. But that's just really wonderful. I really just wanted to address that and say that. And thank you for doing that. And hopefully other people will follow your lead in offering um, subjects something that will live on as a part of the work oh, as well. Um, Alex. Hey, Alex. Alex has asked this question. Do you feel that the specificity of figuration in painting, this is uh, what Jamia was al alluding to earlier, the specificity of figuration in, and also you missed this, painting is in quotes here, further <laughs> marginalizes black people as opposed to abstraction, which resists fetishization. Playing devil's advocate here. And she put a winking smiley as well. <laughs> Alex, you are cantankerous, but I'm into it. <laughs> For this question, hmm. I can go. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Um, so, so I think about this often, and um, uh, I think about this. There was this, you know, um, someone else. Though I, the name has gone out of my head completely. Someone else going um, out. Sorry. Yeah, I, I mean, I kind of said my piece with it, but that's I've, I've heard that conversation since I was at Howard, you know what I mean? Like Sam Gillian versus the, you know, you know, the Afrikober brothers and these beefs, but it's, you know, the question is, what is that? What, what are those conversations rooted in, you know, 
and uh, and, and oftentimes you have that little you know it's I, I hate the word white supremacy white mediocrity whatever you want to call it um it, it has that veil of that you know and I can honestly say throughout my career, as I was navig trying to figure out the art world and navigate through it, I'm just like, yeah, this figure, this figurative shit is dead. I'm trying to, I need to go abstract and, you know, modern. Uh, and I struggle with that. And it, when I kind of like, it's like, forget it. I'm, I can't, I can't fake the funk. <laughs> I, I sort of submitted to the, um, the figurative work, but on the contrary, I see my work becoming more abstract now. How about that? <laughs> and even thinking about getting rid of the <gasps> figure. And that has, and I'm shook. I'm, I'm scared, Alex. <laughs> uh, Lean into it. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know. I, I say, you know, Embrace it. Embrace it. Tiffany. I don't know. I was just thinking right now, like when I was in SVA, um, I was like one of the only painters because I don't know, like a, it's like an art school thing, I guess, that painting is like dead. Um, and to use other mediums to create art. Like I was, like I said, like one of the only few painters. Um, everybody else was like sculpture. Um, and stuff like that until like I really started um, getting to know like more black artists I did notice that there's like a lot of figurative, figurative painting and stuff like that but um I feel like it's needed um, there's not like like how I seen um, art history I've only seen white artists white figurative painters in school you know so I feel like it's kind of crucial to have figurative work now for a brown um, artist. So it can go on with um, the legacy of art instead of just having like white, really important white artists. Does that kind of make sense? I, <laughs> I think there's so much, so many gaps and so much erasure that like, it's maybe just not the time to have this conversation. Like there's still so much to Definitely. be said and done. And, and, you know, like it, we certainly shouldn't be moving with a tide that is not created by us. So at the same time, I'm thinking a lot about, um, uh, you know, how work is created with a certain market in mind. And I think that we all have to be mindful of that, that we start like recreating stuff that's already done because, because white people like it. And I think that that's very true for anything to do with black pain. I find it like we all need to be very, very mindful uh, in any work that has anything to do with, um, with, not that we shouldn't, you know, explore these, these things, but, but, but again, it's about like having this uh, understanding with self about what your motivations are in the making. And then, and then also um, like I'm, like in literature there's this there's this prize called the Kane Prize and now young African writers know how to write for the Kane Prize they know yes, that it's this, this and this and this and this yeah. and then they're going to win the Kane Prize and I and I worry that with figuration like it becomes a little bit like that that people see a kind of uh um you know a, a, a money Humilic. Yeah, and then and then yeah, and then and then try and recreate that formula. Um, so so yeah, I think it's about what Jamie is saying about the pledge to ourselves that also we also need to have a criticality amongst each other, so that we're pushing against ourselves as well as, um, and we're you know, we're n not allowing that not not allowing it, but we're critical when that when we see that that happens to that because I think abstraction comes from those tense, you know, those tensions that exist. It doesn't come from just being like, oh, I don't want to, like, it's not cool to the figure anymore. Ooh. There's like dragonflies like bumping up against the window. I'm just like, oh, what's happening? Um, okay. I think um, 
yeah and then also thinking about the moment the abstraction starts to form this is like post-world war ii and everyone is kind of just like shell-shocked by the amount of violence that has taken place. Interestingly, not against the black body. The violence against the black body has been fine for 200 years at that point, or, or 400, 500 at that point. It's an, it's an interesting conversation actually, to think about like the through lines of, of vision that, that then bring about these different styles of painting. Um, <laughs> and we also, we also cannot take, you know, take out the equation we're we're speaking through fine art but when we're talking about like people of color indigenous people from whatever continent you're looking at we've always worked in abstraction the, yep. the abstraction has been a constant even even it, and now that I'm thinking about it in my work so when we talk about abstraction we're talking about abstraction and quilting and our clothing how we're wearing our hair which the abstraction is part of the figurative paintings you know so it is it's, it's a very um uh what's the word it's it's cyclical or you know that conversation with abstraction is 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 still there mm -hmm. but i don't i don't know if we are fully contextualizing the the full scope of of black art making you know what i mean sure because I mean, we, and do we have to like, is that, is that one person's individual responsibility? I don't think it is. No, no, this is just for conversation's sake, you know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. What else do we have here? It's also 2.46. Is everybody good to like keep going for another 15 minutes or so? Probably. Okay. Um, Charles, Alex, we've answered your question satisfactorily. <laughs> let's see. Charles asks, do you think the concept of purist in art painting is tied to the purity of whiteness? JP, what's good? JP. Um, well, also, sir, could you please, for the sim simplicity of my life, put your question in the Q&A next time? Thank you. Hmm. This question talking about? That's a that's a good question, Charles. Susan, I'm sorry. Can you? What are you talking about? You see, Charles' question. He said, "Do you think the concept of purist yeah. in art painting is tied to the quote purity of whiteness?" End quote. Mm. Do you think the concept of purist in art slash painting is tied to the purity of whiteness? I mean, much of what we do is it is tied. Yeah, but I'm not. I'm not a painter, so I'm gonna mute myself. It is if you care about those conversations. Like I don't know if I care enough about those conversations enough at this point in my life. You know, I mean, it has its relevance, but it's it's like how much weight do you wanna? do you want to give it? I don't. I think you could say that you could argue that the concept of art in general is tied to a purity of whiteness. It is. So like, you know, as soon as you place something in a, in, in an art, Western art context, then you're, you're, you're dealing with yep. uh, being an other in that context. And so, um, yeah, again, like, I think it's like, either you focus on that but then you end up just making work about that and <laughs> and um or you um i don't know do do we just find other spaces to make work in but then what are we willing to lose that's the question what are we willing to lose or what are we willing to build mm -hmm. Right, and that's the and are we Are we ready yet? Like, exactly. like I've been thinking a lot about how, um, you know, if we jump off this cliff now, we're very excited about the cliff, but if we jump off now, is there a soft landing? Have we all made this soft landing together yet? And you I know, don't know if we have. Certainly not, for sure. 
at some point I, when i do, when i think in terms of like the first settlers here in america you know you can have whatever opinion you want of them but they came here like yo i don't know what the hell i'm willing to die i'm willing to sacrifice i'm willing to starve um the question is is like how how bad do we want it or how desperate are we you know um it's and then it goes back to the whole the paradox you know you know you're the you're the question and you're the question and the answer you have all the answers to all the questions you will you will ever you will ever need and so for me that question has also now it's that's this conversation is being extended to how i i make work work how i'm thinking about my work because far too often i'm just still thinking in terms of the with the white gaze right and I, you know i am a colonized individual I, I have to acknowledge that um so just really it's been a like a daily practice to find um to even find beauty in some of the things that i i that's not deemed beautiful right so for example when you um the the words that's been sort of um percolating in my head or i've been thinking about was like hood rat hood rat or ratchet you know like what does what does that mean right and so me looking at that concept of i who rat who ratness or ratchetness um a lot of times that that talks about the people fr from a very specific demographic from a very specific community so that's been a practice of my, for me to be like yo this is beauty and ratchetness this is a beauty uh, a beauty in um it could be beauty there but that's also about it goes back to this sort of decolonization of what i'm willing how how uncomfortable am i willing to get even when it means looking in the mirror or looking at the women in my my artwork so this is this has been a daily practice and even when i was teaching you know i i i i was very intentional about opening opening that up to my students and one of the first questions is before you could tell me about any master you need to know who who's the artist in your neighborhood who the first who the first artist i taught uh, um a pri primarily um el salvadorian demographic when i was teaching and i'm like yo y'all need to find out who the el salvadorian artists are like what's the um so we i don't know i think that we are in very we're in a very interesting time and these are really uncomfortable conversations we're having but i think that they're really they're really pertinent yeah it, it, sorry. it's okay i was just gonna say something quick um those uncomfortable conversations are where the growth happens and like so disclosure um so i i think a lot of you probably already know this but i uh i'm on the steering committee of an organization called the blacksmiths like we literally just formed like less than two months ago among the things that we're doing is developing an institutional an individual as well as an institutional pledge um, and that is actually part of the language is this this notion of this work this anti this this breaking of anti black racism breaking the wheel of white supremacy as it exists in our institutions that present work that in institutions that are meant to be uh, safe spaces and education spaces we have to like really address these uncomfortable discussions it's not work that's going to feel easy to you to do all the time it's just not and that goes for us as black people as well it's not, not going to feel nice um and we have to really you know if you want to make a relationship work no matter what the basis of that relationship is it's going to be uncomfortable and you're going to have to do that you're going to have to deal with that so that's all i want to say you can go ahead uh, um i was going to say that um it's also about the responsibility of the artist for changing how we have we how we have the capacity to you know to change or gentrify spaces so so you know you go like if you think uh, in an urban way you go into spaces that are that are um uh, cheaper to live in and whatever and then and then they become cultural spaces and we do that and so also, so I'm thinking about language, like what you were saying about language and these words. Um, as soon as you put them in, a, in an art lingo and an art 
kind of contacts and suddenly fucking dairy fucking salts is using them in a way or whatever like people are using them in this way that is like ah oh, come on so we also have to be aware that like that is a function of of um of yeah the societal kind of uh pivot that happens um when artists do stuff so there's a there's a um there are these two critics in England. I don't know if you've heard of them, the White Cube. Of course. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> but I think they're great because they, they write in, in a way that, um, that completely undermines. They write super, super critically and super knowledgeably in a way that just really undermines uh, any kind of authority. Like, you just can't come back from that critique. It's just like all over once they like. <laughs> And I think that's really brilliant. Uh, okay. So, you know what? I don't think we should take any more questions at this point. Because um, it's just going to, we're just going to be here for like another hour. <laughs> um, thank you all so, 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 so much. Like, I think this was a really rich conversation. I hope there have been screenshots. Now's your final opportunity, you all, for the screenshots. Um, <laughs> Alba has said, I want to give thanks to each of you for all your physical work you've shared with us today, as well as all the conversational, emotional work <laughs> equally, which has been, <laughs> which has been Sorry. equally enriching. I am fueled by your intellect and creativity, and I'm walking into the rest of today with so many new questions, feelings, and inspiration. Mil gracias. Okay, I'm not going to read that part, but thank you. Thank you to everyone. Thank you, Jamia, Tiffany, Phoebe. I appreciate all of you so deeply and I'm so grateful that you accepted this invitation to be in this conversation today. Um, hey, Shantae, Darla, JP, Quincy, Bianca, are you new? You're new, I've never seen your name before. Thank you for saying something. Thank you everybody, Maria, Susan Chen. Thank you everybody who, I'm not gonna read the whole participants list. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you everyone. Have a fantastic day and I look forward to next week. Soon to be announced. Have a wonderful one. Thank you all so much again. Thanks right. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye